Now, here on Academy FM, we run educational projects for young people to improve their communication skills. One project is funded by the Wellcome Trust, a scientific organisation that promotes the public understanding of science. Eva, a student at the Folkestone Academy, is interested in robots and how we can make them more humans. More like humans, sorry. Professor Howard Bowman is from the University of Kent. He hopped on a train to visit us and here, and here is him answering some questions from Eva. In what area of life are robots very common? Okay, so robots are very common at the moment in, say, industry and manufacturing. So, in factories for, say, making cars, yeah, if you go back 50 or 60 years, it was human beings that made the cars. Yeah, you had a production line, and each human being would be you know, screwing in something or putting a rivet in, and it was all done by, by humans. But now most of those jobs are done by robots, yeah? So you see these robot arms, which kind of move around the car, you know, put a rivet in or, you know, uh, paint the car. So, so those sorts of jobs in manufacturing industry um, are now... Largely, largely unsuccessfully done by robots. But the question then comes, what, why can robots do that, but there's other things that we can't get robots to do? <laughs> in what areas of life would, you, would we, in the future, like to use robo robots? Okay. Do you have any things where you could imagine a robot might be useful? Mm. No? Mm. What about in the house? Yeah, so... Um, you, your mother, your family has to clean the house. Yeah? You have to hoover up mm. to wash the dishes, all these sorts of things. So it's at least in principle possible that you could build a robot that could do a lot of those tasks. So in a sense... You know, we have machines now that have taken away a lot of the tasks that people had to do, like cleaning clothes, you know, we have washing machines, etc. So could you have a robot which kind of chugs around your house, cleaning it, hoovering and cleaning it? Now, there are primitive robots that sort of do that now, but they're not very good at it. They're not very successful. So that would be an area where robots could make an important contribution and could remove a lot of tasks that we don't like doing. <laughs> yeah? How can robots be used in medicine to improve yeah. people's health? There's lot, so that's an area where robots, you know, all, in a sense already, well, they're not strictly robots, but if you like, you know, computation, computer methods are used a lot. But the potential for robots in the future is very, very large there. So one example is, and this is already happening to some extent, you, you could have, and this may seem a bit scary, <laughs> but you could have, in, in surgery, yeah, when the surgeon is operating on you, one of the problems is <laughs> that, that, that the surgeon doesn't have a, you know, the human hand is not very accurate, yeah, in what it's doing. So you could have robots doing that. And that happens to some extent already. This may not be a pleasant thought, but it happens to some extent already. That you could have a robot arm which is making the incisions, etc. So that there's a, so that the surgery is more accurate, yeah, than the human hand can be. So there's stuff like that that's already going on and people are already developing those sorts of systems where you're just trying to improve uh, surgical methods on the basis of, you know, things that humans find hard to do or we can't do very accurately. So there's things like that. There's also really kind of crazy ideas that probably will eventually be possible that you could, you could develop very, very tiny little robots 
that you could kind of inject into the bloodstream or something like that. And they could kind of chug their way around inside the body, yeah, inside the blood vessels or inside other pieces of tissue, perhaps looking for damage or tumours or things like that to try and give a better diagnosis of ill health. So looking for a, tr a tumour that might be in, in the lungs or something like that. And then potentially also when it finds, say, a tumour, perhaps being able to release some, uh, some medication or something or something radioactive which destroys that tumour from the inside. So that's another really, you know, sort of science fiction-y type thing that at least in principle may be true, you know, with these tiny little robots chugging around inside your body, <laughs> you know, looking for stuff. Will the robots stay in your body forever? Well, they could do. Probably the examples I was thinking about, they would just go in to have a look for a sort of diagnosis to try and find out whether you have a cancer and what it looks like or perhaps take a biopsy of the cancer or some you know, something like that. Take some piece of tissue that can be taken out and then analysed. But there are also possibilities, and in a sense, of things that would be permanently in the body, sort of robotic type um, artefacts. And in a sense, we already have things a bit like that. So, for example, people can have pacemakers, yeah, which are are, are, are regulating the heartbeat to control it. Yeah, they're trying to give a rhythm to the heartbeat. Um, and also people have implants to control pain. Yeah? So they, they literally place little implants into the spine where all the nerve tissues are. And then you literally have a little device inside the body which you can turn on and off, right? Not through a switch, but, uh, you know, electronically. You can turn it on and off. And that will regulate w this signal that's being generated in the spine to block the pain signals coming up. So in some sense, we have things like that already. And, that, and there's all sorts of possibilities for that in the future, developing those things further. So, for example, you could have little devices which are monitoring the level of hormones or chemicals or whatever in the body all the time yeah? and then perhaps releasing some other chemicals in some fashion which is controlled by the level of a hormone in the body yeah so for example my mother doesn't have a thyroid gland yeah and the thyroid gland controls the metabolism of the body so she takes medication to get that, get those hormones, because she can't generate them herself. So, and that's fine, but you don't know exactly what the right level is of the hormone at any one moment. So if you've got devices which are monitoring what's going on inside the body continuously, they can potentially enable a more accurate release of hormones and chemicals into the body um, and can resolve a whole load of problems associated with with medicine etc and what expects of human behavior is it easy to get robots to exhibit re reproduce and what are more difficult yeah okay so so this is a sort of interesting and slightly surprising thing that, in, that there, there is one sense to which robots in some ways or let's say artificial intelligence so computer systems one of the surprising things is that in some ways they're, they're good at doing the things that we find hard but there's also a sense to which they're not so good surprisingly at doing some of the things we find very easy and we don't even notice we're doing so a classic example would be playing chess games like chess and when our people were first talking about artificial intelligence sort of 50 or 60 years ago 
they thought that if they could get a program to play chess, yeah, as well as a human, then somehow they would have developed a true artificial intelligence, something that's intelligent is as intelligent as human, but is artificial, is not real. Um, and of course, now, the best player of chess in the world is a computer. Yeah, the computer be beats all humans, just about. I think the best Russian chess player has, a, you know, he has a quite a diff quite a close competition with them. But effectively, the chess, the chess, chess is now best played by a computer. And yet, we would think that chess was quite hard, right? That's something that seems difficult for us to do. Yeah, you, you, yeah. have you played chess? Yeah. Yeah, it's difficult, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, the, so, so the best, you know, thing that there is in our world to play chess now is a computer program. Yeah, it's not a human being; it's a computer program. So that's an example of something that seems very hard for us to do, that actually the computers can do very well. But there are other things that are very easy. We find very easy to do. In fact, we don't even notice we're sort of doing it, which, which is very difficult to get computers to do. So examples would be, for example, um, you know, we walk around coordinating our limbs and our body without noticing that we're doing that, yeah? But we do it in extremely well, yeah? You know, you're going to walk out this door and walk down the corridor and you're not going to fall over or bump into things, <laughs> hopefully, yeah? yeah. So, um, so that's something that we do almost without noticing it, but it's actually quite hard to get robots to do it. So, and there are other examples, like a, a famous example that people have given in the past, is, you know, well, for example, if you look down there, there's a bag, yeah, on the floor, which is all crumpled up, yeah, but you look at it, you know straight away that's a bag, yeah, you know exactly what it is. That sort of problem is actually quite hard to get a computer system to do, a computer vision system. Yeah, because it's all kind of crumpled up. It doesn't have, doesn't seem to have the shape of a bag. Yeah, but actually, we do it straight away. We don't even notice it. Mm. But actually, so, so, so a lot of those things that we sort of do almost subconsciously without thinking about it turn out to be very difficult. So that's kind of s surprising. That the things that we do that we find consciously hard to do, playing chess, other things like that. Actually, you can get robots to do very well. But the things we don't notice we do, sort of subconsciously, are actually very difficult. <laughs> They're not easy to get programs to do it. And it also sort of means that there are amazing abilities that we have, yeah, but we just don't notice them. We don't notice that we're doing it. Thank you very much for coming in, and I enjoyed it. Thank you. I enjoyed it a lot as well. There's Eva then talking to Professor Howard Bowman of the uh, of the Wellcome Trust. He came all the way down from the University of Kent, hopped on a train to visit us here and to have a chat with Eva. 105.9 Academy FM.